and just play that softly because I sense the Holy Spirit's touching some lives in this house. And I know during this season we are about to move into, there's more breakdowns, there's more breakups, there's more stress, and there's more pressure. And that need not be for the child of God. Because I know a God who cares, who's a good, good father, who will turn graves into gardens. I know a God like no other God. Every other God is little G gods, but our God is big G God. And he's able this morning. And he's assembled us together to show us his great love to us by touching us. I'm so glad we serve a God that touches us. Not only can we touch him, but he touches us. And something happens when he does. Things change when he does. And I just sense in my spirit this morning there's some individuals who need that extra touch who are facing a insurmountable object. There's an old hymn in the hymn book that says, got any mountains that you can't tunnel through? Got any rivers that you think are uncrossable? And then it goes on to say, but our God specializes in things thought impossible. For with man, things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. I just feel like this morning, for those who need God to intervene in their impossible and make it possible, I want you just to step out and come. I want you just to meet me here in this altar so we can agree together that we serve a great God that will make a way. And some of you, you need it this morning, so please don't let what I'm about to minister on stop you from coming, and that is pride. But let's come with humility into His presence and experience His greatness. Come on, sing that again. I just believe there's some folks need to be in this altar this morning that God wants to touch miraculously. Come on, friends. God bless you today. Thank you for coming. Others of you, you need to come here. this morning.
you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We call you Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. presence this morning.
I want to take just a moment and share with you something I feel in my heart, in my spirit. If you have a Bible, would you go ahead and turn with me to Luke's Gospel? Luke chapter 18. Go down to verse 10. Jesus is talking, and he tells this parable or this illustration. And he said, Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Now, now, I want you to look at that. He prayed thus with himself. This is what he said. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithe of all that I possess. Then the scene changes and Jesus says, and the tax collector, standing afar off, would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. I was telling the praise team and the prayer team this morning before we came into the sanctuary. What a great Thanksgiving we had. I said, I believe no one told me otherwise that everybody in my household was on the same page. No one was fussing with the other one. I don't know about you, but if your family's like my family, that's a miracle right there. And if it wasn't the case, don't tell me. I'm ignorance is bliss. I'm happy with that. We had a good, we had more than enough food. We had a good Thanksgiving, and that got me to thinking. I got to thinking about how Thanksgiving, Brother Jerry, that there's more pies served at Thanksgiving than there are at any other holiday. Now think about it. Christmas time, we got Christmas candy and Christmas cookies, Christmas cakes. We got all this stuff, but at Thanksgiving, we have pies. And we were like that. We had lemon meringue pie that Lori loves and I hate. We had a fudge pie that was so decadent, a small piece was all you could handle. We had pumpkin pie made from real homegrown Polk County, Arkansas pumpkins. The only pie that we had missing was Miss Brenda's pecan pie. Hint, hint. (laughs) But there was one pie that we didn't have. And I dare say you had it at your house either. The pie that I'm talking about is called humble pie. You ever eat any of that humble pie? It's not as decadent as the fudge pie. It's not as tart as the lemon pie. It's not as savory and spicy as a pumpkin pie. As a matter of fact, a lot of times that pie will make you have a displeasurable taste in your mouth. Because why? We don't like humble pie. We don't like putting ourselves last and others first. You know what we need to be? We need to be more like Chip and Dale, not the Chip and Dales, but Chip and Dale. You ever watch that little cartoon? 
Chip and Dale will come to a doorway and Chip will say to Dale, no, after you. And Dale will say to Chip, no, after you. And they get into this little uh, conversation of wanting the other one to go first. And and I, I got to thinking about that. We don't even stop anymore. We just barge right on through. As a matter of fact, we live in a society today that has no chivalry left in it. I recall and remember when you walk to a doorway, and if I see some of you guys do this today, I'm going to get you. I remember when we used to walk to a doorway, and if there was a lady present, we held the door and we waited until she passed through. You watch our society today. There's no chivalry anymore. There's no gentlemanness about us. And you want to know why that is? Is we become pharisaical in our lifestyle. Well, I'm just glad I'm not like the other guy. I'm just glad I'm not a sinner like that person is. I got news for you. The Apostle Paul hit the nail on the head when he said, and such were some of you. And he put a list out there that you don't want me to read in your presence because it might sting your precious little ears, honey. And it might prick your little heart, darling. And it might cause you to remember from where we came from, church. You see, I came from humble beginnings. I had a good father and a good mother. But I remember coming to a church with no air conditioning and gas heaters. I didn't have the wood heaters, but I remember the old gas heater in the church. I remember slatted pews that if you didn't stand when the heavy lady on the pew with you stood, your bottom got pinched. I remember that. I remember just right out here a little privy that we had. I don't even know what that is. It was an outhouse. The only plumbing we had was wood, and if you slid off of that, you got a splinter. So you learned how to delicately sit down. Pastor, have you been a little graphic this morning? Are you trying to be humorous this morning? No, I'm trying to be real with you and let you realize something that the church has gotten away. I'm not, I'm not saying shut out the lights and bring the coal lamps out again, the coal oil lamps. I'm not saying turn the air conditioner and the heat off in the house. I'm not saying rip the padding off your seat and let you sit on an old heart. We had chairs in this church growing up, Will, that was made out of rope in the bottom. Rope. Hemp rope. Rope that had little particles that stuck you. I don't know what it was back in my day, but little boys wore short breeches sometimes to church because that's probably all we had to wear. And I hated sitting in those chairs because it was like sitting on a pile of needles. I was never so thankful in all my life. I still have one of those chairs tucked away that where Sister Anafe and Brother Johnny, who had a car uh, upholstery shop, made little naga hide cushions to go over them to cover that rope bottom chairs and we thought we was in high cotton then because he wasn't sitting on needles anymore but i thought about that this morning i thought dear lord put a few pins and needles in the pew this morning poke us a little bit make us uncomfortable a little bit because we're living frightful we're not as thankful and as humble as we should be. And I could prove it to you because we live in a society that God is now resisting. Oh, I know he's here this morning. I know he's done a work here in this house this morning, but I understand that we are living in a time of the result of pride. You know what that result is? James chapter 4, verse 6 says, He gives more grace. Therefore, God, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God's resistance is what we see when we are proud. Have you ever prayed for something and it seemed like it just never materialized? You ever just demanded of God, God, come down and take care of this? It didn't happen the way you wanted it happen you know how that is 
It's a religious spirit. It's the same spirit this Pharisee had. I am thankful that I'm not like other men. I have a pastor friend of mine who said concerning the church that we are proud of our humility. And there's no such thing. Now, pastor, I am not prideful. Let me ask you a question. Do you fully rely on God or do you try to do it on your own? If you're one of those individuals who give God lip service but not heart service, and you're out there trying to do it by yourself, you are prideful. You know what you are saying without verbalizing it? You don't need God. And that's pride. As a matter of fact, you are bordering, oh, oh this is going to hit you hard, so you better buckle your seatbelt on this one. You are bordering on atheism. Because the atheist says in their heart, there is no God. And I do it all on my own. Years ago, they came out with a little pen. It was in the shape of a frog. And it had F-R-O-G. And it stood for fully rely on God. Now, we can say we rely on God. But do we? Or do we try to help God out at every chance that we get? Can I tell you this morning? God doesn't need your help in godly matters. He's God's sovereign. He is on the throne this morning. And what he demands and requires of us is to depend on him like no other. But I find myself, I am just as guilty as you, dependent upon my checking account, my automobile, my house that I live in, my health. But I've got to tell you something. 2022 has taught me something. I own nothing. I have nothing that God has not given me that in a moment could be taken away. I have learned as the Apostle Paul said, whatever state that I find myself in, and he wasn't talking about Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. He was talking about the condition in his life at that moment to find myself content. Now, how do you do that? You depend on God. You depend on God. When you get down to the point where you realize, Lori and I had that aha moment a few weeks ago, again and again, he's just repeated it to me. See, I, I've had these health issues, and I started getting these medical bills in. And I made a mistake. I looked on the page, on the web page of our insurance, and I saw how much just the hospital bill was. Two hundred and forty plus thousand dollars. I've got insurance. Thank God for insurance. But I'm like you, I have a deductible to pay and I have a percentage to pay and I have all of this to pay and all of a sudden in my mind I said, I don't have enough money to pay this bill. That's just the hospital. We get bills every day. We get bills just about every day from doctors I don't think I ever even saw or heard of. You've been there. You've done that. I would, I would probably be a, a, a shaken person this morning if I totaled the grand total up all because of a gallbladder. I've done everything I knew to do. I had a few guns stuck back. I called a buddy of mine up. I said, hey, I need to sell my guns. He came over and he bought just about every gun that I have. He paid me. I turned around. I took that money in, and I just said, here, put it on the hospital bills, honey. It ain't even a drop in the bucket, but just throw it at it. 
And I've been worrying and fretting and stewing, and the Lord said to me this week, when will your pride stop? And your humility kick in. I said, Lord, I've been humbled. I mean, I've been humbled. I, I've, let, I've let nurses and doctors do to me and see me in states and condition that my mama was the only one that's ever seen me in. I, I, I'm pretty humble. He said, no, you're not. No, you're not. You're sitting here fretting and worrying, thinking, well, I can take out a loan to do this, and I can consolidate this, and I can do that. And I said, Lord, well, you know what you want me to do? And the Lord said to me, I want you to de depend on me. I want you to rely on me. And he began to take me back to times where he made a way where there seemed to be no way. Back when I was just a little boy, and God said, did I not prove myself to you then when you were but a child? And now you think yourself more highly because you're a man. I will tell you what a man is. A man is someone who can depend on God for everything. For strength to get up and go to work in the morning. For God to provide the job that he has provided for him to do. For a man to be a person who would just humble themselves. You know, can I just be real with you this morning? I, 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 can, I can tell your humility. I, I don't mean to be sharp in my tongue this morning, but I can sense humility in people. You know one of the ways I sense it is when we worship. I watched a movie this past week, and this individual came before a king. It's a story of a king, a kingdom, and this person came in, and, 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 and their life was in absolute shambles. They had been uh, kicked out of their country, and they came in before the king and fell at the feet sobbing and weeping, just reaching out to touch the hem of his garment. And humility over what had happened in their life. And in this story, the king was gracious and bidded them asylum and offered them a place in the, in the palace and met their need. And I thought, as I'm watching that unfold, I'm thinking, God, forgive me, because in my worship, I have come before you with arrogance. I have come into your presence, and I've said, I don't like that song. That song doesn't move me. I would rather sing this song. Am I striking a chord in the house? You're real quiet. Would you just take a deep breath to make sure you're still alive? Thank you. You see, we come into the presence of the King of kings and Lord of lords, and we have the audacity to not bow and not worship. Oh, I don't want you to be emotional and roll in the floor for emotion's sake or rolling in the floor's sake. I want you to be so moved because of the humility and your utter dependence upon God that you know from where your source comes. There's nothing that has been given to us in this world that God himself has not given. I watched a man one time who drove a fine Corvette convertible. I couldn't tell you the year number of it. It was one of the original ones. It was worth a lot of money. He lived in a presumptuous house in a presumptuous neighborhood. He attended the church that I pastored, and he made great fanfare of his abilities and his money. I'll just say it like that. He made a statement one night. I'll never forget. It was a Wednesday night in a classroom. And he said, I will tell you this. God didn't give me that Corvette. God didn't give me that house. And God didn't give me the money I have in my bank account. I worked for that money. 
And I shrank. And I trembled in my spirit. I thought, oh, friend, you've put yourself in a precarious place. You've put yourself outside the realm of God's grace and his mercy by your pridefulness and your self-righteousness. Isaiah said, our self-righteousness is as filthy rags. I'm going to be very graphic with you this morning. That word filthy rags in the ancient language was the same word used for the strips of cloth that were used by the women during their monthly cycles. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. And I wanted to say something, but the Holy Spirit stopped me. And he said, you watch. and You see what comes from a prideful spirit. You see, the Word tells us that pride and a haughty spirit comes before a fall. And I'm afraid. I'm afraid that's where we are in America. And I'm even more concerned with that spirit that is in our world today has infiltrated the church. I watched as his marriage crumbled. I watched as the Corvette left the parking lot and another car came in its place that was not near the value and the caliber that once was. I saw a man in perfect health begin to decline and diminish. But let me tell you what I also saw when he realized the error of his way. He repented before the Lord how God brought grace back to his life. What are you telling me, Pastor? I'm telling you this morning, church, Jesus said it like this. Let, let, let me just read what you, you Jesus said. Jesus called them to himself in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20, verse 25, and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Verse 26, Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your servant. Slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. See, there's a reoccurring theme throughout the New Testament. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, Amanda, if you'd come and just play softly behind me. Chapter 2, verse 3 through 11, he said, Let nothing be done with selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also the interest of others. Verse 5 said, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him, given him the name which is above every name, 
that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Just as I can see a person's pride, my pride when I look in the mirror, I can see the humility of so many of you. Your servants. Your servants. And you know what servants do? They anticipate ways to serve. I'm going to tell you something else about a servant. They don't at, wait to be asked to serve. They just serve. We've been watching a series called Downton Abbey. And it's about the upstairs and the downstairs, folks. The upstairs are the royalty, the rich. The downstairs are the servants. And some of the upstairs people treat the downstairs people like trash. But I've watched how this series unfolded and how there were individuals in the downstairs that made a statement that they were servants. And that was their lot in life and they did with integrity and intentionality. And they did it because they understood what Jesus was talking about. Next week, we're going to talk about the remembrance of Christ at the communion table. But on that same night, the scripture said that he broke bread that he took a towel and wrapped it around himself and he took a basin and some water and he knelt down and he washed the feet of his disciples. They didn't understand it. Peter said, you're not going to do it. The Lord said, Peter, if I don't do this, you have no part in me. And Peter jumped up and said, not only my feet, but my hands and my head also. Otherwise, he was saying, just give me a bath, Lord. <laughs> we live in a world that is void of humility and servanthood, but God has stirred my heart. I sat in my office yesterday and tears ran down my cheeks as the Holy Spirit began to just deal with me about the leadership and the direction of our church. And while we talk a good talk and we have a good reputation in the community of being a church that is attentive to needs, the Holy Spirit just spoke in my heart and said, I want this group of people to give more than they've given and serve more than they've served this next month. I have on my sacred desk here four ministries. Two of them are international ministries. Operation Compassion. Franklin Graham's group. Just a few days ago, churches from around our area, we've done this before, put together shoe boxes to be sent an Operation Christmas Child around this world. We didn't do that this year. But we're going to send shoe boxes. How can we do that? We're going to give an offering. And here's the thing. This offering's not going to cost you one red cent. 
We have a little ministry in Newport, Arkansas. Can I just tell you where Newport is? It's the armpit of Arkansas. I, I Thank God I am here in Polk County, Arkansas. Newport is smack in the middle of the delta where the mosquitoes have to have clearance from the FAA to land. They're that big. And I'm not exaggerating. You talk about poverty. We don't have a clue. The only person in this church that might have a clue is Shannon Lyle. And when she graduated from college, in conjunction with her schooling, they sent her to the Delta to teach. And what an education she got. And we have a little pastor over there by the name of Tim Bumpus in Newport, Arkansas, who the Lord moved upon and said, I want you to form Project New Start. And it started out with just a little ministry here, and then it began to grow to a little ministry there. He does his own version of Teen Challenge. He has a home for battered women. He has a home for children. He has a home for men. And they go out in the community and do service work to meet the needs of drug court. He's dealing with people you and I honestly sometimes don't want to acknowledge or deal with. And every few months, he'll send us a little cheap. I love it. It's the cheapest newsletter you've ever seen. It's so unprofessional. And you know why? Because he's not going to spend thousands of dollars on glossy pictures and fancy paper. And there laying on my desk was the November newsletter. And the Holy Spirit said, bless them. Bless Operation Compassion. Bless the Bible League. We've done this. These are partners. We've partnered. These are not strangers to our church's budget. We had a lady a few months ago come in and talk to us about Casa of the Washitals, I believe is how it's written, of how many foster children that are in the system in our, our county. And I just pulled out sticky notes. And as the Lord led, I wrote amounts. And I wrote to our church secretary, please write a check for this amount to this ministry. Stuck it on that paper. I did that four times. The amount is $1,500 cumulative total. We have the money in the bank. And I'm asking you, in a called business meeting of this church, to give your pastor approval to do what the Holy Spirit said to do. To give more than we've ever given. Oh, it doesn't stop there. There's an angel tree downtown that has little angels on it. I want our church our church, not you, our church. That means all of us. To go get 10 angels off that tree and meet every need on that list out of the church treasury. December is one of the largest expenditure months our church has. I get a Christmas bonus. Our associate gets a Christmas bonus. Our secretary gets a Christmas bonus. Our janitor gets a Christmas bonus. What we've been doing for the last almost 20 years of my pastorate here is every widow in this church gets a gift card out of the Christmas budget for our church. Some of you didn't even know we did all that. But above and beyond that, God said, 
serve. Serve. Anticipate where you can bless and expect nothing in return. I got news for you. Even though we do it without the anticipation or the expectation, you cannot outgive my God. Whatever you sow, you reap. And I'm here to tell you what little seed you put in the ground always comes back in a larger capacity in a bountiful harvest of blessing. But the Lord has called us to leave our self-righteousness and to depend on God fully this year. Now, some of you, this is going to be a stretch. Some of you, this is going to be a challenge. Some of you, this is going to come natural to But I'm trusting God that we make an eternal impact on lives. More this December than throughout the history of this great church. And I need you to lay aside our pride. I started to bring it in here with me this morning. A towel in the basin. <laughs> and to just ask that you would come by and symbolically just pick up the towel and the basin and say, I'll serve. I'll serve. I'll go. I'll do whatever you want me to, Lord. You know what got me into ministry other than the calling of God on my life was a little course that said, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you could use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet touch my heart speak through me if you can use anything Lord you can use me oh we used to sing it like this Jesus use me and oh Lord don't refuse me for surely there's a work that I can do. And even though it's humble, Lord, help my will to crumble. Though the cost be great, I'll work for you. Would you stand with me in the house? If God has been better to you, and he has, than you deserve, then we are called to be servants in a world that is undeserving. Our example is the Lord Jesus who did not come in regality, who did not come as a superhero Messiah that the world was looking for, but came as a lowly babe in a barn in Bethlehem, who was raised by lower class parents and lived a lower class life. The Son of God who left the splendors of heaven waited until he was 30 years old, endured humanity in honor and respect to his earthly father and mother and to his heavenly father. He never
never led an army. He never taught at a college. He never carried the title that was befitting and worthy of him. But he came and he said it like this. I've come to serve, not to be served. Now he is at the right hand of God the Father. And we, the sheep of his pasture, the flock of the Almighty God, the ones who are to be the lights in the darkness of this old world, are called to do what Jesus did and have holy humility and serve like we've never served. Would you bow your heads, Father, right now as hearts are attentive to your Holy Spirit. And we've had our moment of chastening. And now we humble ourselves to you. And we say, Lord, use me. And not, don't refuse me. For surely there is a work that you've got for me to do. I'm telling some of you in the house, you have retired and you think that's all there is in Christian service. But I believe this morning you're about to be refired for service. As a matter of fact, if you take that word retired and you break it down, that means to put new tread on. I believe God's fixed to put some new tread on some of you. And God's going to open doors for you to be His hands extended and His feet walking into this old world. So why don't you just make that fresh commitment to Christ this morning and say, Lord, I'm willing and I'm dependent and I don't have much but what I have you've given it to me anyway and Lord if you desire for me to give you the whole lot of it back I'll sign it over to you tomorrow and I'll serve you for your kingdom's sake and for the lost and dying that are around us in Jesus name we pray amen and amen I know I've been a little lengthy this morning but I had to share what was on my heart and I believe we're going to see God do some great things and I want you to just bring an offering this morning whatever the Lord has blessed you with I know the Lord has stirred my heart to begin to give more this season than I think I can afford to give because he is such a good God. And so there was a little extra in my check today. But God's dealing with me. You let him deal with you accordingly. Father, we thank you for the season we are about to enter in. We thank you for the many blessings of the last 11 months. But let this month be the blessed month that we portray your love and your light in a world that is lost and dark. In Jesus' name. Amen.